Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to New Zor Education. Uh, today we will talk about how to store electric charge. And the device which we are considering is, is called capacitors. So I will talk about how to store electric charge in the capacitors. Now, um, this lecture is part of the course Physics 14 presented on unizor.com. I suggest you to watch this lecture and all other lectures because it's a course actually from the website. They're presented in a logical order. There are some problems solved and there are exams and the site is completely free. So, um, so go to unizor.com. Now, um, so our purpose is to store electric charge. Well, first of all, let's just think about it. Let's assume that we are somehow capable of making electric charge. What, what does it mean? It means that we have an object where we have an excess or deficiency of electrons, right? Well, let's say excess. I mean, excess means we have to take it from somewhere. Now, the world is relatively neutral, right? So we can't really uh, take anything uh, from some storage of electrons which is somewhere um, created by, by, by God or something. No, we have to take a, 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 any kind of a neutral um, object, electrically neutral object, and just borrow some electrons from them, from, from the atoms of this neutral object, and put them into another object, which uh, let's call it X minus. Now, whatever is left will have deficiency of electrons, right? And that would be X plus. And that's how we create both positive and negative charges from the neutral. How is a different question? We're not talking about this right now, but there are some devices which do this type of thing. But for now, let's just assume we are managing somehow to create from one object, create another one, and separate these electrons into another one. And whatever is left would be with a positive charge. By the way, equal in magnitude. This is negative, this is positive. Now we have to store it somehow. Well, for practical reason, obviously, we cannot store it like very far away because that means we have to transport these electrons somehow it's kind of a difficult so let's consider we have two close to each other objects which we have managed to create by separating electrons now we have to prevent if we want to store it somehow for future reasons for future reasons means we have to really put some kind of a lamp let's say in between and then the flow of electricity will light it up etc doesn't matter to have it uh, to, to, to store it we have to prevent uh, discharge between them because if we will just put two different objects together relatively close to each other one is negative another is positive maybe the spark will be uh, b between them and the spark is actually discharge electrons will go back to wherever they came from and our work becomes basically useless so we have to prevent them from discharge so that's our purpose to store as much electric charge as possible separately but relatively close to each other now let's talk about let's say two spheres I have negative here and positive there now, obviously, since positive and negative attract each other, I will have more concentration of electrons here and more concentration of absence of electrons here. And less on the opposite sides, right? Now, the intensity of the field between these two will be greater than if these electrons are evenly uh, distributed in the object, right? If they are evenly distributed and those absences of the electrons, that would be less because now this is more concentrated, so this is intensity more and this is evenly distributed, intensity less. But how can I prevent this type of 
organization of, uh, uh, of, of, of electrons and their absences? Well, there's only one way to make the whole object very uh, even in terms of distribution of electricity. And one of the best way, at least, is to have it as two flat planes. One plane would be negative, another would be positive. And since they are flat and relatively large, we can definitely say that there is no abnormalities uh, in the distribution of electrons or, or in distribution of absence of electrons. They will be evenly distributed along the whole surface. So these are two planes and, uh, uh, and, and this is ideal kind of configuration when there is no peaks, let's say, where electrons would concentrate and cause spark faster than at that particular point. Well, by the way, that's how the lightning strikes. Lightning strikes to something which is um, like, a, a, like, like a stick of metal, whatever, on the roof uh, we are using specifically for the purpose so the lightning will go into this um, metal rod and somewhere to the earth rather than to a tree or a, or a house or something like that. So, we are trying to make this even. That, that's one thing. Now, next thing that we will consider is something which we did before as a problem number four. Problem number four was about intensity. If this is a disk and you have a perpendicular to a disk line where you have a point, the disk has certain radius r, the a is at the height h above the center of the disk. Now there is a sigma uh, density of uh, electricity charge and I would like to know what's the intensity of the field at point A. Well this is E. It depends of H and it's equal to uh, okay where is it? Uh, sigma divided by 2 epsilon r epsilon 0 1 minus 1 over square root 1 plus r square divided by h square. That's the formula which we have derived uh, in the previous lecture as a problem for, so I refer you to this lecture to basically um, uh, see exactly how it's derived, but I'm just using it as given. All right, fine, so we have this formula. That's good. Now, what we are going to do is we are going to uh, the capacitors configuration like this. Let's assume these are two disks parallel to each other um, on, on the same central line which is perpendicular to the disks and I would like to know what's the uh, value of um, intensity of electric field in between these two. So this will be my x minus and this will be my x plus. So all my electrons go to the left disk and the absence of electrons will be in the right disk. Now my question is how to increase the capacity of this capacitor. This is called capacitor. Which means I would like to put as much as possible electricity Q, coulombs of electricity, and not to have a spark. Now, not to have a spark actually means that um, my uh, voltage between these two should be as small as possible. So that's my purpose. My purpose is to decrease the voltage between these two. Now, voltage, as you remember, is um, amount of work which is needed to transfer one coulomb of electricity from uh, one point to another in the electric field. So, if my voltage is less, so electrons are not really pushed very hard towards from one plate to another. 
So that's, that's what basically allows me to store more electricity. So my purpose is increase Q and decrease voltage. Well, Q is given, so I can't really increase it. I mean, whatever it is, it is. I have, I have to s uh, store a certain amount of electricity. But now how I store it, that's what voltage depends on. So let's just calculate what is the voltage between these two. First, I have to know the um, intensity of the electric field. Now, what is intensity here? Well, let's just think about it. This is E of H. Now, let's consider this distance is D, and this is H, okay? Now, uh, what I can say is that zero is less than H less than D, so H is between zero and, and G, obviously. It's in between these two. Now, uh, obviously intensity is a vector, and if I am talking right now about a point which is on the center line of these two disks, I can use this uh, particular uh, problem and this formula um, to find out what's the uh, intensity at this point from one disk and then what's the intensity of another disk and obviously we know that from the different considerations the uh, uh, intensity which is a force it's a vector which is uh, directed along this line perpendicular to a center so it will be the common line because we are talking about being on the line which is uh, connecting to centers perpendicular to the uh, to, to, to the disks so I can use this formula for one and then for another disk and I will add these two vectors together now if uh, my probe object is plus one coulomb now the negative plate would attract it the positive uh, plate would uh, repel it which means in exactly the same direction so I basically add these two forces together. So one force from this would be E of H, where E is the formula. Another would be E of D minus H, because this distance is D minus H, right? And I'm adding them. I'm not using the sign at all. I'm just adding the absolute value of these two things. Considering sigma is the same here and here, although one is negative and another is positive. Now, um, and here I will do something which <laughs> mathematicians would definitely don't like, but the physicists are doing it all the time, which is the approximate. The formula is kind of cumbersome if I will just put it to all together. However, however <coughs> if my radius of the disks is relatively large and my distance between them, d, and H, therefore, as well, are very small. Then the whole R squared divided by H squared is very, very large, which means the denominator is large, which means that the whole fraction is very small. And apparently it's so small that, again, physicists have decided that for practical cases which we are talking about, it's really completely irrelevant and they dropped it. So they basically have only sigma divided by 2 epsilon r epsilon 0 and then another one so it would be together epsilon uh, sorry sigma divided by epsilon r epsilon 0 where epsilon r is a relative permittivity of the media in between these two plates epsilon 0 is a constant it's a relative it's a permittivity of the vacuum so um, and as you know, the uh, relative permittivity is also called dielectric uh, constant. It's very important, this dielectric, it prevents the electricity, right? So the greater A epsilon R, um, the uh, smaller the intensity of the field in between these two plates. Now, Obviously, with increasing density of electricity, we are increasing the field, and with increasing 
dielectric constant, which means using some other substance in between these two, uh, which prevents uh, electric field to, uh, to, to propagate uh, as much as in the space. So the greater epsilon r, the less intensity we will have. Now, if I will multiply intensity by the distance between these two plates, I will have the voltage difference. And that's what I have to minimize. All right? So let's just think about it. So again, my voltage is something which we should minimize, which is equal to uh, sigma d divided by epsilon r epsilon zero. Now, sigma is basically a total amount of electricity divided by area, right? So by <coughs> by diminishing distance between these two plates, we are decreasing the voltage. By increasing the area of the plates, we are decreasing the voltage. And by increasing the uh, dielectric constant, I mean using a substance with a greater dielectric constant, we are decreasing the voltage. So the voltage will be increased the greater uh, our surface is, which means that the disks are m of a greater radius, right? Uh, the closer they are to each other and uh, the greater dielectric constant is of the media between these two, two things. Okay, let me just continue a little bit further towards um, physicists' approach. Um, now, let's consider that these disks are really very, very big, and the distance is very, very small. And we have a point in between somewhere. Now, does it make much of a difference whether it's closer to the middle of the disks, uh, to the center line, or it's off the center? Well, the bigger the disks, the less difference it makes. I mean, it's generally understood. I mean, obviously we can make exact calculations and have a huge formulas, etc. But this is an obvious result. The greater the surface of the disk is, the less the point, which is somewhere on this disk, knows about what exactly is at the edges. Well, if it's at the edge, yeah, the, then yes, it's important. But anywhere within the middle of the disk, it's really the same thing, with, whether it's in the center line or, or it's a little bit off center line. And the bigger the disk, the less difference it makes. So, another, uh, again, physical consideration. Is it important that this is really a disk? What if it's a rectangular? Again, if it's a big rectangular, there is no difference. So, what people have basically decided that we can use the formula which looks like this for basically any um, large size capacitors which has large area and very small distance between, between the plates. Okay? Now, um, what's important is a, uh, a characteristic of uh, these capacitors which is I'll call it F equals Q divided by V so this is amount of um, this is amount of electricity and this is the voltage which can be observed between the plates and it's equal to Q divided by V which is Q D A epsilon R epsilon zero which is A 
epsilon r epsilon zero divided by d. So you see, there are three major characteristics. Epsilon zero is a constant, obviously. It's a permittivity of the vacuum. The area of the capacitor, the distance between the plates, and the dielectric characteristic of media between, between the plates. So this is basically something which is called capacitance. Capacitance of a capacitor. Its ability to store certain amount of electricity um, at certain voltage. That's what it is. So the greater capacity means now, obviously, voltage is something which, um, which allows uh, electrons to travel from one to another. And the greater voltage, the greater possibility for electrons to jump between the, uh, between the plates. So we are interested in the smaller voltage. So we are interested in increasing the capacity in, ter in terms of uh, amount of electricity, coulombs, and we have to decrease the the voltage between the plates so the capacitors with greater capacitance are of value so we need capacitors of big capacitance all right so um what else is important here uh important is to measure the capacitance so if um, we uh, are putting one coulomb of electricity on a minus and on a plus, minus one coulomb and plus one coulomb, and we observe one volt of uh, uh, voltage between these two plates. This particular capacitance is one farad. Again, <laughs> physicists immortalize themselves by calling the units by their names. So, Michael Faraday, a famous English physicist, in his honor, this unit is called farad. But basically, it's a it's a coulomb. Uh, per uh, volt and what is volt uh, volt is joule by coulomb so you can convert it into so it will be coulomb square divided by joules etc so these are all conversions but let's just concentrate on on one particular unit called farad, so capacitor, capacitance of one farad means that electricity, uh, electric charge of one coulomb uh, has the voltage of one volt between the, between, between the plates. All right, now how can we increase the capacity, capacitance of the capacitor? Well, look at this formula by increasing the area, by increasing the dielectric constant, and by decreasing the distance between them. Well, distance, let's not talk about distance right now, but we can very easily increase the, uh, the area. Here is how. Now let's consider we have two plates. Let's consider we have two other plates. Minus plus, minus plus. So what if we will distribute our charge Q not among these two, plus and minus, but among these four. So we will connect them, and we will connect them. So this will be minus, and this will be plus. Well, 
actually it's the same thing as if I will just increase the area of the left plate by two and right plate by two, right? So basically if this capacity, capacitance of this is C1, capacitance of this is C2, capacitance of the whole thing is C1 plus C2. It's called parallel uh, connection of capacitors. Now, why is it important? Well, here is why. We don't have to really organize it in this way. We can organize it in this way. So, let's say we'll take this, this, and this, connect this to minus, and this, this, and this, connect it to plus. So, what I have here, I have stacked. You see, this is capacitor by itself, and this is capacitor by itself, and this is, and this is, and this is. Because each one of them is, this is minus, this is plus, this is minus, this is plus, this is minus, this is plus, right? That's how they're connected. So I'm staking in the third dimension. So I don't need really two dimensions, two flat thing, increase it in two dimensions. I can use the third dimension and stack them one above another. And if the distance between them is very small, filled with a, uh, a, a media or some kind of a sub uh, some kind of a substance of a very high dielectric constant, then my capacity will be increased. What else they do, not only they can do it vertically, they can do it in a row actually. Let's consider you have two very very long um, uh, metal plate, minus and plus. They will put one on the top of another put in between obviously some kind of dielectric and then roll them together. So they will be rolled like this. One of them and another would be in between. It's exactly the same thing. So we are using the third dimension to either stack or roll to increase the capacity of the capacitor in a relatively small volume. That's, that's all we need. We need to use um, relatively small volume to store relatively large amount of electricity. So this is how we increase the area. We increase the area and uh, uh, how to um, increase the capacitance by using better dielectrics. Well, we do have certain dielectrics uh, with very high dielectrical constant and if we will use them in between the plates in this way or, or in this way this would suffice to diminish the voltage between them. Diminishing the voltage is the most important because that diminishes the probability or possibility of, uh, of the discharge. And basically that's all I wanted to talk about today. So these are capacitors, they are serving uh, for storing electricity. In all electrical um, devices, whatever we are using, we definitely have these capacitors in every computer, uh, on every um, electric power station, whatever. We are, we are always using the capacitors. Sometimes they're very large capacity, with very large, large capacitance, but they're always used to store electricity which we have managed somehow to generate by separating electrons from the other places where now are in in in, in lack of electrons all right okay that's it for today thank you very much and good luck <laughs>